Hello everyone. So welcome or welcome back to this week's Centre for Educational Neuroscience Seminar. To those of you who might be joining us for the first time, we are a research centre in London and we aim to link together what we know about how learning happens in the brain and how learning happens in education. So we are privileged this week to be joined by Dr Lorna Quant from Gallaudet University. So before I introduce Lorna and her topic, we have some accessibility arrangements this week, which I will explain. Firstly, a very big thank you to our colleagues at the Deafness, Cognition and Language Research Centre at UCL, who have assisted with arranging two British Sign Language interpreters, Julie and Jenny. Please message me or Mahitab Elgamal and we will grant you the multi-pin option so that you can see the interpreter alongside the talk. Please be aware that Julie and Jenny will be swapping over every 15 minutes, starting with Julie. Secondly, live automated captions are enabled and we will provide a transcript afterwards alongside the video recording, which will be uploaded to our YouTube channel within a few days. For anyone unfamiliar with the format of these seminars, our speaker normally speaks for around 45 minutes, and then we have 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time during the seminar, or you can wait until the end to raise your virtual hand and either speak or sign your question then. So without further ado, I will now introduce Lorna. So Lorna Quant is an associate professor on the PhD in Educational Neuroscience program and co-director of the Visual Learn Language and Visual Learning VL2 Center at Gallaudet University. In early 2016, Lorna founded the Action and Brain Lab, where she and her team use EEG and other psychophysiological measures to investigate the neural substrates of action, gesture, sign language, and communication. Since 2018, Lorna has led a team developing a virtual reality game for sign language learning, applying principles of embodied learning to create an interactive learning environment. This work has led to new avenues of research concerning the development and utility of virtual human signers and best practice at the intersection of sign languages and emerging technology. I will now hand over to Lorna for what is going to be a very fascinating talk. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Astrid, for that really kind introduction. And thank you to everyone who made time in their schedule to show up today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my work with you. Um, today, I'll be focusing on the question you see here on my title slide. Movement, language, and the brain, what can we learn from sign language? So I came to this field of work uh, with a background in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience, focusing on action perception, how people understand and make sense of other people's movements in the world. And you'll see how that work has informed my approach to sign language research in the past almost nine years since arriving at Gallaudet University. So I'll go ahead with the talk and I am more than happy to uh, take questions at the end. So I will try to wrap up before we get uh, too late in the hour. So I am coming to you here from DC. Uh, Gallaudet University is the world's premier university for deaf and hard of hearing students. And so I'm privileged to take this work on with a team of um, deaf, hearing, all signing, staff, students, and colleagues at Gallaudet. Where does this research start? So I have come to this uh, sort of body of research through this topic, which is put here on the slide, of experience-dependent neuroplasticity. What I mean by that is uh, 
the ways that what we do with our bodies and what we do in the day changes how our brain functions in some way. So that's a pretty broad idea that what we do changes how our brain works. Particularly, there's sort of this field in the area about looking at how expertise with different types of movements, be it body movements or hand movements, how that type of physical motor expertise changes perceptual skills or changes the way that visual perception occurs. So you can see on this slide, we have some different types of movements that humans do, whether it's very precision archery or the fine movements of the hands and fingers in playing guitar or the skills that come along with playing soccer or the full body movements involved in gymnastics. Those types of movements have all been studied through this lens of experience dependent neuroplasticity. Do expert guitar players show a difference in how their brain processes musical notes or in how their uh, visual cortex processes other people playing guitar? These are types of questions that we might look at through this lens of experience dependent neuroplasticity. And of course, I see this as relating to learning because these skills that I've put forth as examples are all things that we might learn through the course of our experience over our lifetime. It might not happen in the classroom, but there's still forms of learning. So we know from this research that action experience leads to changes in perception and cognition. You might be familiar with the example of expert ballet dancers view ballet dancing differently than other types of dancing. When expert ballerinas see others performing ballet, their motor cortex engages more, perhaps because they're drawing upon their own motor repertoire, their own feelings of what it's like to do those movements. What about sign language experience? This was one motivating question that you'll see sort of uh, led to a body of work that I'll talk about today. So if we know that like learning archery or soccer can change how our visual system works or how our sensory motor system works, why not think about sign language that way? And of course, I'll be very straightforward. Sign language is unique in that it is not only an action, but it is language at the same time. So we can approach questions that are uh, more related to the linguistic features of sign language, or we can look at sign language as a body of uh, physical expertise. People who sign have acquired the ability to produce movements with their hands, arms, and bodies in ways that those who do not sign do not have. Just some context about how I think about these questions. We might look at sign language as one part of the puzzle for a deaf baby who is born or any baby who is born to a family. We know that that baby is surrounded by a linguistic environment of some sort. So we might talk about bilingual babies who grow up in um, Spanish English speaking households. We might look at bimodal bilingual families where there's a sign language and a spoken language. And these are all different rich environmental uh, sort of situations in which babies are born, children are raised, and humans develop. And I won't go into it at length today, but we know that for a deaf baby, there are multiple avenues which are presented to their families. Those avenues might include um, sign language from an early age, might include hearing aids or cochlear implants. A quote from research that came out just recently this year, which um, I present to sort of show you how I think about this sign language research. Um, we know that now 
more than 80% of babies in my country in the United States, more than 80% of babies who are born deaf will receive a cochlear implant. In my perspective and from this perspective in the research, um, cochlear implants and sign language do not have to be uh, mutually exclusive. We know this, of course. And we can see in this quote some sort of framing for that idea. Even access to early, short-term, non-native visual language or sign language is beneficial for the language and phonological memory developments of deaf children with CIs. So parents should not be discouraged from learning and exposing their child to sign language. So here I'm looking at sign language as one part of a puzzle for a, a deaf person or a deaf child, one which might coexist with other forms of intervention or may uh, exist alone as the child's primary form of communication and access to language. Given that cultural context and the important debates happening in that field, for this research agenda, I see it as twofold. Potentially, we could have a goal of answering interesting questions about experience-dependent neuroplasticity, so questions about how the brain works and how the brain changes, while at the same time, hopefully being informative to society and informing these debates that are ongoing in the field. Here's the question that my team and I have been working on for the past several years. How might being a deaf signer change perception or cognition? Now, on this slide, it's a little bit of a tricky question because it says a deaf signer. If we see changes in perception or cognition between deaf signers compared to some sort of control group, those differences might be because the signers in question are deaf, meaning that they access more information through the visual modality, and thus their brain may have reorganized or recycled certain areas of uh, tissue in order to take in information through the eyes. So it could be that potential effects of being a deaf signer potential things that we see changed in perception and cognition could come from the sensory state of being deaf or from differences in hearing status. Or if we have that two word phrase, deaf signer, might it be because they are accustomed to using signed languages? And a quick pause that I conduct research on American Sign Language being the sign language in my community here. Um, most of you are probably living in communities that use BSL, so I don't have specific uh, research about BSL. Today I'll say sign language referring to ASL, um, but of course I don't have any particular knowledge as to whether what I talk about today would or would not align with the same findings in BSL. Some might be the same and some might be different. So coming back to this slide, changes that come along in perception and cognition could also be because of sign language, because maybe we have a group of people who have grown up and have 30 years of sign language as their primary form of communication. That involves uh, sensory and motor experience. It involves visual experience of being able to perceive and process uh, fast moving, changing dynamic sign stimuli. There are a lot of questions and we need to disentangle the effects of being deaf from the effects of being a signer in order to better understand where these potential effects might come from. And you might be wondering so far, what effects? So let's look at what effects I'm talking about. In 2019, there was an important review article that came out by Alan Carr and colleagues in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience called What and How the Deaf Brain Sees. 
there were certain parts of the visual system that seemed to be enhanced or modified by uh, the state of being deaf. So in particular, the review covers differences in face identification. Um, in the lower left, you can see uh, these vernier acuity cards. So this is very fine-grained, uh, low-level visual information that uh, deaf people seem to show some heightened sensitivity towards. Um, we also know that there are differences in peripheral vision for deaf signers. And this review article concludes by saying that cross-modal reorganization in auditory cortex of deaf people is responsible for superior visual abilities. So this is all very interesting, and this also focuses particularly on the sensory state of deafness without looking particularly closely at the effect of knowing sign language. So we know that deafness changes some aspects of visual perception, but really what about sign language? And why would I be so obsessed with this question? What about sign language? What is so interesting about sign language? Um, if I think about signed languages as a, a topic of research in this field, there are a few things that stand out for me. People can acquire sign language from birth and have extensive long-term experience with using their primary language every day of their lives for 70 plus years. This is long-term experience. When we look at things like learning to play the guitar or learning to you know, uh, do ballet moves and dancing, those things can be skills that we acquire over a long period of time, but they simply cannot match the depth and richness of the uh, experience that someone has with sign language as a primary language. Signed languages are also highly spatial. As you know, they occur in a three-dimensional space in front of the signer and between the signer and the um, conversation partners. The use of space is highly rule-based. Um, there's a lot of spatial memory required and spatial cognition playing into uh, production and perception of signed languages. And third, um, just simply the visual motor complexity. Here, I'm fingerspelling my name just to emphasize that some of the movements in sign language occur very quickly, occur on a very fine greened uh, scale of space and occur um, rapidly in succession. So the visual motor complexity is quite high. Also, sign language lets us explore questions about it as a language, because unlike those other examples of actions that we know change our brain functioning, sign language is actually are all human, natural, full languages with rich complexity, even beyond what I've listed on this slide. Coming back to our question, so both deafness and sign language change perception and cognition, what would that look like? could be more related to hearing status, could be related more to sign language experience. So let's look at one way that we tried to tackle this question. This is a study that, that is most closely related to how we see sign language itself. Um, this study was led by very recently uh, named Dr. Carly Liana. She just defended last month and is now doing a postdoc at Vanderbilt University in the States. This study was a peak COVID study. So um, you'll see in my talk today, more behavioral research than I usually would have shown, but the past couple of years have really given us a lot more behavioral, large scale online data collection opportunities. So you see here, we ran a study with 283 ASL users. We had these really interesting stimuli, which we created 
which are point light displays. So we make them by uh, recording points on a person's body as they sign. And then we create these displays here. I'll give everyone a chance to see this video again. This is a place name, like a city or a country. Try and see if you can decode what it is in the ASL. So it's an extra challenge. If anyone got it right, 100 points to you. This was Barcelona. So we use these stimuli to try and assess the fine-grained uh, influences of what predicts fingerspelling skill. Fingerspelling reception, understanding others. We had two types of stimuli. Some were real place names and some were fake place names that we made up. We also varied the stimuli. Half of them had a high number of markers on each hand, so a very dense array of information. And some had many fewer markers. So uh, I'll show you this video on the right. It's Barcelona again, but with fewer markers. So there's even less information. Unsurprisingly, we found that a high number of markers was significantly more easy for people to understand than a low number of markers. And importantly, we found that earlier ASL acquisition is strongly correlated with higher accuracy. And I realized I should have told you, we showed participants these videos and had a free text entry box where they typed in what they thought they saw. So if they knew they saw Barcelona, they just went ahead and typed in Barcelona. If they weren't quite sure, they typed in the best that they could. We found overall um, here on the left are responses to fake pseudo place names that we made up. And on the right are the real place names. And you can see across the board, our deaf participants are more accurate, which is what we have on the y-axis accuracy. Deaf are much more accurate on both the pseudo and the real place names. And remember, these are all people who know sign language. So it, it does encompass people across a range of fluency skills, but everyone here was able to understand sign language to some degree. However, our fake place names were really, really challenging. On the left, we can see the effect of age of acquisition. So to the left is age of acquisition at zero, all the way up to learning ASL at age 40. And you can see that the later someone learned sign language, on the top, you can see that they became less accurate as their age of acquisition got higher. And on the bottom, you can see that their confidence in their answers also decreased as they uh, had a higher age of acquisition. On the right panels, we see the effect of ASL fluency. So this should not be surprising. As people are more fluent, they are performing more accurately and with more confidence. So this tells us that, uh, you know, this is a reasonable measure of fingerspelling perception, although we were not aiming to validate it as an assessment measure, but that's something that we could look at in the future. We further broke this down by looking only at early signers, people who had learned ASL from uh, age before five. So even among early signers, deaf participants are outperforming hearing participants, particularly on these fake place names when they don't actually have any external world knowledge to draw upon. So imagine if you saw what you thought was Barcelona with those point light displays, you could probably interpolate and guess that Barcelona is a good guess, so you could type that down. But with a fake place name, you have nothing in the real world to draw upon. So you're relying only on your perceptual skills. That makes the pseudo place names much harder. And it informs us about the extent to which top-down influences are affecting accuracy.
to briefly summarize that paper, we saw that features of the stimuli themselves, as well as semantics and linguistic background of the viewer, all impact finger spelling perception. So finger spelling perception depends both on your own skills and your own language skills, but also on what you're seeing. Plus, as a bonus, which I like to mention, we have these stimuli of point light display finger spelled place names, which are uploaded to the internet for anyone to use for their own studies. But that study was only about signers looking at sign language, which doesn't really satisfy my desire to understand more broadly how sign language or deafness might impact perception. So other than looking at sign language, what could it look like if sign language or deafness brings a benefit or a change to perceptual skills? I hypothesized that deafness and sign language both might change or lead to better spatial skills because of what I discussed earlier about the importance of three-dimensional space for sign language communication. And also something that I've been particularly interested in is whether sign language and deafness contribute to better biological motion perception. And then we're keeping in mind, how do we figure out if the effects are from deafness or sign language? I'll work you through, walk you through two studies that uh, we have done in our lab to look at this question of increased spatial skills. So this study was led by Dr. Emily Kubitschek, who graduated a couple of years ago. She looked at whether mental rotation was associated with sign language fluency. <clears throat> so she used a typical mental rotation task um, where you see a picture of blocks like you see on the left, and you have to match which two are correct matching to um, sort of a target, uh, target sample of blocks. I see in the chat that there's some glitching on um, Julie's video feed. So um, I'm not sure if anyone has anything that they can do, maybe um, interpreter switching or troubleshooting on your end. Thank you for noting that, Kate and Elizabeth. Thank you. So with this um, study, we administered this block, uh, this uh, mental rotation task to a bunch of signers. And we found that yes, there was a significant correlation between the score on the ASLCT, which is an ASL comprehension test, and their scores on this mental rotation task. So the better you were with comprehending ASL, the better you were with this mental rotation. This is not causational, uh, but it is correlation. We've done more recent research looking at another spatial cognition task. You might be familiar with block design where a participant is given blocks with different colors. They're asked to match the blocks to make a picture as shown on a model. And my current student, Melody Schwenk, has shown that higher proficiency in ASL with those ASL CT scores is associated with higher scores on block design. So we find that yes, particularly ASL fluency seems to be correlated with better spatial skills from these two studies. This is across different hearing statuses and is particularly linked to ASL skills, not a uh, hearing status or any other factor that we looked at. Now we will turn to biological motion perception. So broadly speaking, that is a skill that we humans have. We are really good at seeing other animals, particularly other humans moving. 
So your ability to discern this woman walking down the path, you are using biological motion perception skills that our human brains have evolved to really be good at. Um, we can recognize a friend walking from 50 feet away. We can recognize a human, you know, walking in a crowd. We have pretty good skills when it comes to biological motion. One way that we like to study these questions is by using these point light displays that you saw earlier. So we might use them to make a display like this where we see an everyday movement, jumping jacks, for instance, shown only by these points of light. So we're removing all the information about what a person looks like or their environment, and we're focusing only on the motion trajectories so that we can understand how we respond to different types of movements. So why would sign language confer better biological motion skills? Why do I think that? So for a few reasons, um, like I showed you this uh, sample video before, seeing fingerspelling or signing requires a form of biological motion perception. It requires us to understand someone else's movements and make sense of them. And when you're fluent in sign language or proficient in a sign language, you can perform that skill of understanding sign language, not only under ideal conditions of well-lighted, well-clipped uh, videos facing straight at you or a one-to-one -one arrangement like this. No, when you're comfortable with sign language, you are able to understand what someone is signing from a fair distance away. So when the visual stimulus is much smaller, taking up less of your visual field. You're also able to understand sign language under subpar lighting conditions in a dark restaurant. And of course, there are limits to these perceptual skills, but they're flexible skills. And you can see here on the right, the way that sign language is really used in natural human communication is usually a combination of these different things. You're conversing with someone and maybe you're at a funny angle, you're not looking straight at them, you're to the side and there are multiple people all conversing and maybe it's a little bit dark and maybe there's backlighting and maybe you're attending to different conversations. So my hypothesis has been that this ability to use sign language production and perceptual skills may give us a uh, benefit when it comes to other types of motion perception. I almost think of it like a uh, visual cocktail party effect. So if you're familiar in cognitive psychology with the idea of the cocktail party effect in spoken language, that's our ability to isolate important stimuli from a crowded, noisy environment, like if someone calls our name at a cocktail party, we can attend. Similar idea I have about the ability for a deaf flu or for a fluent signer to easily pick out the important information from their environment and attend to it, even when that environment is busy, visually crowded, um, and perhaps not ideal viewing conditions. I propose that both being deaf and knowing sign language would factor into this ability to uh, have particularly good biological motion perception. What we did to examine this question involved creating new stimuli. So we used a motion capture recording studio to record six different everyday actions like jumping jacks, kicking a ball, um, a golf swing. And we recorded each of them from three different perspectives. So front, oblique, and side angles. So we had 
18 biological motion stimuli that showed real movements. Then we made control versions of those videos uh, with scrambled dots. So they matched the uh, actual biological motion stimuli, but did not show a real action. I'm going to show you what two of these videos looked like, with the point being that some of them were very easy to see and easy to understand, and some of them are actually quite hard. So the job of the participant in this case was to say um, whether this action involves a ball or not. So like golfing involves a ball, but jumping jacks does not. So does this require a ball? Most people can easily say, no ball, just jumping jacks. Here's another one, a little more tricky. So that one is throwing a ball underhanded, and most people get it easily, but it might feel a little bit harder. First, we asked people for subjective ratings on how hard was it for you to understand what you saw. Purely subjective, but tell us what you saw and how hard it was. And very interestingly, we found a significant difference based on hearing status alone. Deaf participants rated that it was significantly easier for them to understand what they were seeing compared to hearing participants. This was a significant difference, but it's purely subjective. It was part of a EEG cognitive neuroscience study where we wanted to see uh, the sensory motor involvement of the viewer's brain when they were seeing these type of biological motion stimuli. So I'm going to show you next the results from the EEG study in which we asked deaf native signers compared to hearing non-signers to look at these images, these videos, and like I said before, just check whether each image uh, or video required a ball or not. So for each one, they were sort of processing what they saw and thinking about what type of movement that was. On the top, you'll see uh, EEG res responses from deaf signers. And again, these are deaf native signers. And on the bottom, we have hearing non-signers. And our question with this was to look at how the sensory motor cortex of the brain processes those actions that they're seeing. And given ideas of motor simulation or embodied cognition, we expect from previous literature to see that uh, people are using their sensory motor cortex to, on some level, decode the type of movement they, they are observing. And remember, these movements have nothing to do with sign language. They are just jumping jacks and uh, throwing balls and stuff like that. So these are EEG results showing activity in the alpha and beta frequency ranges of the EEG signal across the sensory motor cortex of the brain. So where we see these dark blue blobs here, it, our easiest interpretation is that that indicates an involvement of the underlying cortex. So the brain underneath that area is more active. We are comparing between those biological motion videos and the control stimuli. So we expect to see differences in how people respond to the real movements, the jumping jacks and uh, kicking, compared to the scrambled controls that don't show a real movement at all. And we found that there is enhanced earlier and more consistent differentiation between those two types of stimuli in deaf native signers. So you can see that here where we compare uh, the two categories um, statistically to see that there is earlier differentiation in the low alpha range and more consistent differentiation across the time span. So the um, they're more consistently and more quickly 
discriminating between real and scrambled movements. This was very interesting to me, but I still was not satisfied with uh, this question because still here we're looking at a difference between deaf native signers and hearing non-signers. We don't know yet if it's more about sign language or more about deafness, and that's what I want to get to. So we finally bit off this question by looking at how hearing status and or ASL exposure affect motion processing. And are certain types of motion processing particularly affected? This work was led by Dr. Athena Willis, who is doing her postdoc at Rochester right now, and she graduated one year ago. For this work, we recruited broadly, big online study. We had 224 participants, including deaf signers, hearing signers, hearing non-signers, people in between, part of hearing group, and some deaf people who reported low fluency with ASL. Here you can just see a count of how many people we had in each group broken down by their ASL fluency. So we did have a lot of deaf fluent signers, um, not very many deaf folks who weren't fluent. And hearing, we had pretty good representation uh, with a lot of hearing non-signers. So with this broader sample, we were able to run regressions to test our hypotheses about how different factors related to ASL or hearing status might influence people's biological motion perception. We showed them three types of motion perception, ranging from really low level visual perception on up to more complex action identification. We gathered accuracy and reaction time data. We had all these three different hearing status groups a total of 224 participants. And we gathered background information. What I'll focus on today is their age of acquiring ASL for people from any of these hearing status groups. Here's their question for the most complicated task. And my students joked with me when I was showing them this task, they were like, Lorna, are you trying to break people's brains? Because this task is really at the upper limit of what people can do with biological motion perception. The question is, does this movement involve a ball, just like before? But this time, half of the stimuli are standing upright, and half of them are upside down. Here's the upright one. Does this involve a ball? It does not, it's just someone running. Does this involve a ball? Look to the right. I know that this involves a ball because I've seen these stimuli a bunch of times. This is someone golfing upside down. So this is about as hard as it gets and we wanted to really probe. Yeah, it is a tough one. We wanted to really probe people's uh, biological motion abilities because like I said, our brains are pretty good at it. Good job, Kate, you got that. <laughs> what we found is that deaf people are faster at perceiving people. So one of our tasks was a person identification task. Is there a person or not a person? Deaf people are faster at doing that and deaf people are faster at that most complicated task that I just showed you, identifying the actions. So deaf people show a significantly faster reaction to two types of motion processing at the cost of less accuracy on that task of identifying actions. And I'm gonna show you the data to break it down a little bit more. Most importantly, the results on this page are controlling for sex, age, ASL fluency. It is a significant effect 
based on hearing status specifically. So here's what this trade-off looks like that I think is really interesting. And I'm gonna move a little bit quickly, but I'm happy to discuss offline or um, in Q&A, which I'm going to save time for. So here we have reaction time on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. And each color is a different group. So our deaf participants are in the blue line group. We see that for the other two groups, hearing and hard of hearing, as they take longer to do the task, the RT gets higher. As they take longer, they're doing worse. So people who are hearing and who do really well at this task are answering pretty quickly and pretty accurately. However, none of our hearing or hard of hearing participants are answering nearly as fast as the deaf participants who are much, much faster, statistically speaking. However, you can see that the deaf participants have a tendency towards answering quickly, but less accurately. So they are privileging speed over accuracy. And we have a paper coming out shortly about this. And uh, our main takeaway is that for deaf people answering very quickly at the cost of accuracy is probably more advantageous than waiting to make a more correct choice. Um, there is a cost benefit analysis on how quickly to respond to a movement in the environment. And we see here that speed might be privileged over accuracy. We also saw significant effects of age of acquisition. So now we're not as much thinking about hearing status, but looking at ASL fluency or age of acquisition. We saw that earlier age of exposure here on the x-axis was linked to higher accuracy on that last task. So that hardest visual perception task, deaf participants and hearing participants both, the earlier they learned ASL, the more accurate they were with that. What we can take away from this research, including some of what I talked about earlier, is that deafness leads to a unique approach to complex motion, wherein we see people prioritizing speed over accuracy. We also see that early sign language exposure increases accuracy with biological motion perception, and that high sign language proficiency increases spatial cognition and skills, or that they're at least associated, if not causally. So zooming out to experience-dependent neuroplasticity, we can conclude that sign language experience alongside deafness change perception and cognition. And we've pieced out a little bit more about which uh, parts of that puzzle contribute independently. There are no negative effects of sign language found across the studies. And the more research we do, the more we see is yet to discover. So I thank you, the audience, and those of you who invited me today, and I thank many contributors, collaborators, team members, and funders of this research. I'm happy to take questions, and also you can always find me at my email, which I'll type into the chat. Thank you so much, Lorna. Absolutely fascinating.